The famous motivational speaker, Zig Ziglar, uh, before he passed, would often share uh, one out of many stories whenever he had a speaking engagement or a conference. And this particular story uh, was about training fleas. And I have to be real honest with you, uh, when I first heard about this, all I could think is that's, that's not a thing, right? Because I am convinced that everybody shares the exact same opinion about fleas, that the only good flea is a dead flea. And yet, training fleas. So how you go about training fleas is this. You gather a scratch of fleas. And uh, a scratch of fleas is, of course, the official name for a group of fleas. And uh, I get the guy who, who was in charge of naming all the groups of animals, he was having way too much fun uh, when he was on this one. And I think he was a little bit on the nose. But so you gather this scratch of fleas and you place them in a mason jar. It's a clear glass jar. And then you, of course, you put uh, a lid on top of it. You screw it tight because you don't want the fleas to escape. And then you observe. Because training fleas really is less about anything that you're going to teach them and more about how they're going to condition themselves. And as you observe, you'll notice that the fleas are trying to escape. They want to go right out the hole that you just put them into. And as you observe, you'll watch the fleas again and again jump and hit the bottom of the lid. They'll slam their bodies into it again and again and again. But as you watch, a slight shift happens. The fleas, they stop slamming themselves in the lid and they start jumping just shy of the lid, just shy of where the opening was. And then to fully train them, you wait. You let the fleas jump tens, hundreds, thousands of times, just shy of that lid. And then when you're feeling brave, you go ahead and you unscrew the lid and you observe again. And what you'll see is that the fleas have been fully conditioned. They will no longer jump to the height of the lid or out the jar. They will remain jumping at the previous height, just shy of the opening. And they will do so despite their physical ability, despite their desire to escape the freedom. Uh, they will continue jumping this way until they perish. And the thing about this story about fleas is it wasn't really about fleas. It's about you and I. It's about mankind, of how we uh, condition ourselves that when we are made free uh, through the work of Jesus Christ, we will too often return to the lifestyle we previously lived. We will return to living what we used to know and never fully embrace the freedom that is offered in Christ. Today, we're going to be looking in Galatians 5. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. And we're going to be continuing our series, Unearned. We're going to be looking at uh, the idea of freeing grace. And in this, this chapter, that is what Paul is all about. He wants the church in Galatia to understand the importance of the freedom they have been given in Jesus Christ. He starts out, verse 1, he says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. His first sentence, he's going to hit the topic he wants to dive right into. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. It's an incredibly simple idea. Christ has made you free to be free. It's in, the word, it's in that sentence twice, free. And yet, what he's seen in Galatia, what is true about the church today is that we understand this idea. We can look at it and say, yeah, that's right. But we often don't live it. That we have confused the reason that Christ has set us free. That often what we do is we say, Christ has set us free for our ticket to heaven. And I don't want to downplay our eternal salvation. That's absolutely true. But there's so much more going on. There's so much more that Christ has for us. Prior to being a campus pastor, uh, I worked as a children's pastor here at Family Church. And I saw one of the myriad of reasons that the church has given that we are free. And during my time as a children's pastor, I, I would study a lot about the failings of children's ministry in the past generations. And there's study after study that as, as, as kids uh, graduate from high school, that they flee the church. And one of the reasons they found is because they don't ever come to understand the truth of what Christ has set them free to. That they believe Christ has set them free often uh, so that they can be good little boys and girls. 
that Christ has set them free for the sake of behavior modification. That when they're out and about with mom and dad in public, that they don't embarrass them. And the church has rewritten this statement too often to say, it is for your pleases and thank yous that Christ has set us free. And Paul saying, man, if if you're substituting anything but freedom in there, you're missing the boat. And the sad reality is that it's not just kids who are learning this, it's, it's adults. We see it all the time. People come into the church and they believe that Christ is going to set them free uh, to make them more upright citizens, to make them look better in the eyes of others, to make them morally good. And there will be a part of that down the road as a byproduct of everything that he's given us, but that's not what he was about. And Paul's getting frustrated. He continues to go on. He says, stand firm. And do not let yourself be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. He gives the command, stand firm. He understands that, that we need to be intentional, intentional about living in the freedom that God has for us, that Christ has given us. That we will backslide, that we will return to slavery. He never, I don't think anyways, he never trained fleas, but he understood that we are just like them. We will live according to how we used to live, never experiencing the freedom that we are given. And so he's saying, stand firm, do everything you can to embrace this freedom that has been so freely given to you. And then he goes on and says, do not again be burdened by a yoke of slavery. And this is vivid imagery for the people he's writing to. And he's writing to Galatia. It's an agrarian society. They're intimately familiar with this yoke. And for us, it, it loses some of the power. Because we, I think we all understand a yoke, but our, our understanding of a yoke it's limited to the textbook we read as kids in a grade school or, or when we went on a field trip to an old-timey uh, barn and saw it hanging from the side of the barn. But they would have understood it intimately. They would have known exactly what it was like because they used it all the time. Right? The yoke was this massive wooden in- implement that was placed on the back of oxen, and it would bind them together. Where one went, the other would have to go. If one went left, the other went left. If one went right, the other went right. If one went forward and the other back, they were stuck in place. They were tied together and they could not escape one another. And, and from that yoke, they were, they were tied to a plow that would work the earth and it was backbreaking work. There's a reason that they put yoke, or excuse me, oxen under the yoke and not people. And behind that, that plow, behind the yoke, was a master their owner who would direct them where to go. And Paul says, do not ever put yourself under a yoke of slavery. You have been set free. Never, ever return to slavery. And he's going to give a couple things uh, that he sees that we can never go back to, that we are free from. The first one is we are free from legalism. We are free from legalism, which is adherence to laws and regulations in which we earn our right standing with God. He says, that's, that's not what Christ has, has done for you. And, and this is a big issue. He's fired up. He says, mark my words. And we know he's fired up because there's an exclamation mark right here. He says, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to the whole law. And a lot of the guys who are listening today just got real, real quiet. But before we move on, I want to make clear the circumcision he's talking about. He's not talking about the circumcision that we're familiar with uh, in the Western world. It's not the medical procedure that something like 80.5% of all males born in the United States undergo shortly after birth. He's talking about something very different. He's talking about a procedure that was, that was symbolic, that was ritualistic, religious in nature. And it was one that was under the Mosaic law, the Mosaic covenant, in which uh, all bo- uh, men would undergo according to the law, which they would undergo that marked them as a member of the nation of Israel, a member of God's people. And in doing so, it would place them fully under the law. And Paul says, Wait, what are you doing? You're now asking people to be circumcised under the law. You don't get to pick and choose. You either are under the whole law or not at all. Why would you return the circumcision? And this, this was a recurring 
problem within the early church. There was a group called the Judaizers. And they were uh, Jewish Christians. They were Christ followers who came from a Jewish background. And and they were intermixing with the Gentiles, that is the non-Jewish people who became believers in Christ, Christ followers. And these Judaizers were coming to these Gentile Christians and saying, now uh, that you are following Christ, you now have to be circumcised uh, to be a follower of Christ. And Paul's saying, whoa, whoa, slow down. You're not to be circumcised. There's no reason for these people to be circumcised. They're followers of Christ. They don't exist under the Mosaic law. And he goes on, you who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. So what, what, in, what in the world are you doing? Why would they need to be circumcised? They are, they are saved by grace now. They are justified in the sight of God because of the work of Jesus Christ, not because of anything they do. And, and to be clear, this, is, this circumcision was under the, the old law, the Mosaic covenant. It was a conditional covenant between the nation of Israel and God. Yahweh. And it, it, it was a system in which the, God gave his, uh, would give his blessing to the nation of Israel, and in return they would follow his laws, regulations, commandments. It had nothing to do with justification. It was simply about that. If they, if they followed his rules, he would bless them, and if they broke his rules, he would curse them or punish them. And here come the Judaizers, and and, and they're under this new covenant, this covenant found only in Jesus Christ. And it's about justification. It's about our right standing with God. It's about salvation. And they're saying, hey, you need to take this old covenant, this Mosaic covenant, and the new covenant, and you need to mash it together. And Paul says, they're not, the, the old covenant, excuse me, the Mosaic covenant, the law has nothing to do with justification. You cannot be justified by your works. So why are you combining them? Why are you trying to make this Frankenstein's covenant? Jesus has come to justify you by grace through faith. It's not about works. It has nothing to do with that. You cannot be saved by what you do. The law was never meant to be an antidote to sin. The law was to be a magnifying glass. It was to, to reveal the depths uh, uh, the sin of man and the inability to, to, to earn one's salvation and the necessity for a savior. Two chapters before this, he says, there is no new life found in the law. So what are you doing to these people? Why are you putting them under this burden? And, and, and you, you will have no righteousness through this. Righteousness is to come. You can't be made righteous by the law. Paul understood this intimately fully because he, 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 he had tried to do this. Paul was, he talks about it, he, that he was a Hebrew among Hebrews. And according to righteousness, by adherence to the law, he was found blameless. But it wasn't true righteousness. It wasn't a righteousness of God. It was a righteousness that was in his own eyes. It was a righteousness found in the eyes of others. But it wasn't righteousness that God was looking for. Because he could keep all of the actions, all of the works, he could do all the things. Deep down, he was, he, was, he was sinful. The law was never intended to justify. So why would you now apply the law to a work of grace? And Paul's super angry about this. right? He says, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. It doesn't matter if these people are circumcised or uncircumcised. It it doesn't matter at all. Stop making this a big deal. The only thing that counts is faith, faith expressing itself through love. You are running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. He says, why have you abandoned this truth? Do you have abandoned the truth found only in grace through Jesus Christ? Where did this come from? It wasn't through Jesus. It wasn't through him. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, will have to pay the penalty. Brothers and sisters, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. 
As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. Paul says, if you're going to find your righteousness in the act of circumcision, just go do the whole thing. Take it off. It's not important anymore. This, is, this was about the old law. You need, to be, you need to step out in faith, not in works. And for you and I, this still plays a great deal. I don't know anybody who's, uh, who, who practices under the law. But I still see this idea that somehow we're going to work our way to God, that we get, we get grace, but then somehow we're going to work our way to God as well. And, and I see this in believers and non-believers alike. For non-believers, it's this idea that I'm going to get to heaven, I'm going to get to be with God, and I'm not really sure what God they're talking about. But they're going to get to be with God. They're going to have right standing with God by, by doing enough good. But the truth of the matter is you cannot do enough good because good enough is found in perfection. And I don't see a whole lot of people standing around. It's perfection from beginning to end, not attaining perfection. And that was only found in Jesus Christ. And unfortunately, Christ followers have, have bought into this idea too that they understand the idea that we can't earn our way to God. We can't earn our salvation. And yet what they do is they, we accept this free gift. And I say we because I've been guilty of this as well. We accept this free gift of grace. And then we set out to repay God. That yeah, I wasn't going to earn my way to God, but I'm going to pay him back in full for the gift that he has given me. Jesus never intended for that to be true. We've gone ahead and we've replaced God as our taskmaster with Jesus as our banker. And even though we know we couldn't earn it on the front end, that somehow we brought into this idea that we're going to pay him back on the back end with interest. It is about grace, not about works. It's not about you earning your standing with God. It's everything about what Jesus has done for us. Paul's going to go on, and he's going to see a second thing that we are freed from, and as our, we are free from slavery to sin. He is really worried about uh, how this idea of freedom is going to be misused, that they're going to take it and say, oh, well, I have grace, so I'm going to go about doing whatever I want because I'm forgiven. Paul says that's a blatant misuse of the work of Jesus Christ. He goes on, he says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. That you, in your freedom in Christ, are not given permission to do whatever you want. That is a twisted misunderstanding of freedom. It says, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul wanted people to understand the true meaning of freedom and it wasn't found in pursuing our fleshly desires that in doing so what we do is we replace the infinite joy, the infinite goodness that Jesus Christ offers, and we replace it in the pursuit of temporary happiness. Paul wanted more for us. Jesus Christ wants more for us. He set us free, not so we can go return to who we were, living out the desires of our flesh, living according to the will of Satan, living according to the ways of this world, but living fully in the Spirit. He says that if you are in the Spirit, if you're walking with the Spirit, you cannot be walking, (laughs) pursuing the desires of the flesh. They cannot coexist. And when Christ, Christ saves you and the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God enters you, 
He is repulsed by the desires of the flesh. He wants nothing to do with it. He wants you to have nothing to do with it. He wants you to flee. You cannot pursue both. And Paul says, do not ever return to a yoke of slavery to sin. It will chew you up and spit you out. It will feel good in the moment, but in the end, it will own you. And your master now isn't sin. It's not Satan. It's Jesus. And he talks about how these things, what they are is their pursuit of selfishness. They're about making oneself feel good. And he says, the law is fulfilled in loving others as you love yourself. And when you pursue the flesh, eventually it will come, and often really quickly, it will come in conflict with loving others. It will cause only hurt to others. And you cannot follow God if you're setting out not, with the, not loving other people, not serving them. So flee from the pursuits of the flesh. Free from the desires. But Paul's going to go on because there's something else he wants. He wants us to understand what are we freed to. We are free to live abundantly. The freedom that Christ has granted us is to live abundantly. In John 10.10, 10, it says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I, this is Jesus talking, I have come that they, that's you and I and everyone else, may have life and have it to the full. Jesus came so that we could have abundant life. This, this word full here, okay, in, the, in the original Greek, it's this word perasos. And I'm saying that a little bit off. I apologize. Perasos. And it means not full because this is kind of, this is misleading a little bit. This translation is not my favorite part for this. I love the NIV, but this is where I think it gets a little bit wrong. This picture of full, like you have a cup, you have a cup and it's filled right to the very top. And this original word would mean exceedingly abundant. I don't picture full. I picture a cup that's overflowing. That cannot contain everything that Christ has to offer. It cannot contain the life that he is giving. He wants to give us so much more than we can imagine. And the thief is in direct conflict with that. He wants to destroy us. He wants to give us death. This is the conflict between good and evil. Jesus and Satan. Jesus wants us to have life, abundant life, and Satan wants us to have death. And the confusion arises here that I, the church has bought into too often, I believe it's a lie from Satan, that the life Jesus has exists solely in our future with God in heaven. And yet what Jesus would say is it's not just about your future with heaven, with God in heaven, it's your it's your kingdom-minded living in the present today. If you go ahead and take a look at the ministry of Jesus, the entirety, most of the time, he didn't talk about heaven. He talked about it a lot. Don't, don't get me wrong. He wasn't against the idea. He, he wanted us to have eternal life. But much of his ministry was about how to live fully in him today. It is what he modeled. It is what he taught. It is what he wanted for us to live abundantly on earth in him. And the thief, the lie he has sold is that you don't have that life today. It's only in the future. And so what is this, what is this life, this abundant life look like in our life? How does that play out? Well, in the end, this is what it looks like. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. That how it plays out is th this abundance, this overflowing of, of the work of God within us. That the Spirit is producing this within us. And when we are exceedingly abundant in it, it overflows out of us. It's not just so that we can experience the fruit is so other people can experience the fruit. That they can come in contact with a person who, who has real, true love for their neighbors. Not a love that the world can produce. Not a love that they're familiar with. But a love that only God can produce. A love that the world will never understand. And that they will come in contact with a person who has joy. Right? Not happiness. 
right? Which is determined by, by, by what's going on in our lives, but true joy, which is found only in God that exists whether things are good or bad and that they can come in contact with the ha- person who has peace, a peace that surpasses all understanding. When we are living abundantly, this is what our life looks like. What an amazing life that God has to offer. And how do we go and do this? He's going to go and he says, those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step by the, with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. That we live an abundant life by following the Spirit, the Spirit that lives inside of us. We walk in step with it. That it involves this idea, contrary to our understanding of freedom, it involves submission to the Spirit, submission to God. And I know that seems complete opposite, freedom and and, and submission. But that's a twisting of true freedom. It is found only in true relationship with God. Pointing back to the beginning, Paul talked about, don't be burdened by a yoke of slavery. See, for Paul, when he was writing that, the yoke wasn't the problem. It was what you were yoked to that was the issue. He was concerned about people being yoked to slavery, being yoked to legalism, being yoked to to sin, being yoked to Satan, being yoked to the world, being yoked to our own egos and self-righteousness. You are always yoked. Whether you want to admit it or not, whether you like it or not, each and every person, we are yoked to something at all times. And what Paul wants is not for us to be yoked to slavery, but be yoked to Jesus. Jesus himself, he said, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, And my burden is light. Jesus wanted us to be yoked to him. Paul wants us to be yoked to the spirit of Jesus that lives inside of us. You have a master. True freedom is only found in being, uh, uh, yoking ourselves to the master of Jesus Christ of God. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to dismiss to the campuses. I love you guys. Thank you. Thank you guys for sticking around today. Our transformational moment is is a question that I have for you. And it's, what are you yoked to? Paul was adamant that we are not to be yoked to slavery, that we can never be free when we return to slavery, when we choose to live according to Satan, the fleshly desires, uh, self-righteousness, legalism, on and on and on. And that the only thing we are to be yoked to was the Holy Spirit, that Jesus gave us this Holy Spirit and so the question I have for you is, to, is, 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 would you spend some time really evaluating what are you yoked to right now? Are you yoked to a fleshly desire? Is there something in your life that you are pursuing that is a twisted view of freedom? Are you finding freedom only where it's supposed to be found, which is in Jesus Christ? We also have a mission in the moment. We've been talking about our blessed strategy. It's a way in which we can go out into the world, live as disciples, live as missionaries in our own community. And we've come to the first S. We've gone through B, begin with prayer. Start every day praying that God, would you would make it known where you are working so that we can join you. The L, listen, listen to people's stories. Don't come in with an expectation of how you're going to serve them with what they need. Just listen. Let them be heard. Find out where they are struggling. Eat, eat, invite them to dinner. Invite them into your home. Start to build real true relationship. There's power in eating food. And and it doesn't just mean you have to invite them to your home. Go out to dinner with them. Go out to coffee with them. Maybe even go to their own house. And then we bring it to S, to share. Finally, after you've built real relationship, then it is time to share the gospel, then it is time to share the power of Jesus Christ and the freedom that comes from him. Before I go, I want to pray for you guys.
Lord, thank you so much that you have set us free, that you have granted us true freedom. Like Paul said, Lord, help us to stand firm, to embrace the freedom, to grab it wholeheartedly, to, to not be to, to not return to our previous ways, to not indulge in the flesh, to, to stand firm in you, Lord, and the freedom that you have given us. Lord, let us trust in the spirit that lives inside of us, produce in us uh, the fruit that you have, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Help us to be people that look like Jesus Bathe us in your love. Transform us so that we can live abundantly. We love you. In your name, amen. Thank you guys and have a good day.